thanks, Dr. Juan Manuel. I'll just get started here. Apologies in advance for having to go fast with this because 15 minutes may not be enough time to convince you to stop doing anterior stabilizations on your throwing athletes, but we'll have a crack and see how we go. Mandatory disclaimer slide. So what I really want to get across to you is that this is not the essential lesion of the throwing shoulder and therefore stop trying to stabilize these guys, but instead look at rotational range of motion and rotational shoulder strength. And along the way, we want to discuss the etiology of how high-level throwers, of how high-level throwers get these injuries. So, firstly, what is the pathology that we commonly see in these guys? Well, it's posterior superior undersurface cuff tears and type two slap lesions, and it largely comes from the fact that you have to do this every single time you throw hard. Every time a high-level thrower throws hard, this is what they do at their shoulder. And the mechanism, or the purported mechanism initially described by Gilles Falsch of so-called inside impingement is the posterior superior cuff folding inside the um, greater tuberosity and the adjacent posterior superior glenoid. But the argument has always been, these guys must have an anterior instability because they come in and tell you they have a dead arm. And we know throwing happens in abduction and external rotation, so doctor says likely this is where anterior instability happens. And when I do a relocation sign on these guys and I push this part of it back, the head of the humerus must be going back and that must be what takes their pain away. So it must be an anterior instability. Well, one of the first things that I'd try and get across to you is that somebody who's dislocated their shoulder, and no doubt there's somebody in the room here who's done that, the central feature of it is that they'll tell you their shoulder came out. And people who hurt their shoulder when they throw never tell you their shoulder comes out. They tell you my arm hurts. Oh, well, wait a minute, wait a minute. It's not that it actually dislocates all the way. We've got this micro instability. It's, trust me, the instability's there, but it's just not big enough for you to see it. I know it's there because I'm smarter than you, and I can tell when the instability's there, but you might not be able to see it. All right, well, let's explore that a little bit. If this was a continuum of micro instability <coughs> anteriorly that was the central feature of an overhead throwing athletes shoulder pain, then I'd argue that this should be on a continuum. If all of them were doing maybe a little bit of slipping forwards, then some of them must be doing a lot of slipping forwards. So if we went and looked at these guys who are doing this all the time, and that was what was causing them to get their injury, at least some of them should be dislocating and probably at a higher rate than people who don't do this day to day. So let's look at the evidence for that. In people who don't throw terribly much, 500 skeletons, about 5% of them took evidence of bony anterior dislocation to their grave. Bony hill sacs or bony bank cart lesions. Of course, this completely precludes people who dislocate their shoulders without soft tissue injury. So the people who have an anterior instability and take it to their grave, the incidence is probably higher than 5%. Of course, you don't have to go and see a doctor if you dislocate your shoulder. So that probably explains why in a series of about 2,000, Hevelius found maybe a little bit less than 2% of the people have a history of dislocating their shoulder. Now we come to the people who throw, and I've got two categories of throwers here. Cricket's a sport played in the former British colonies where throwing is incidental to the game. It helps if you can throw, but it's certainly not central. You won't get a job in cricket just because you're a good thrower. At least that was the case in 2002, although it's changed with the short format of the game more recently. John Orchard's series of about 500 cricketers has showed a lower incidence of anterior instability in the throwing arm of any of these guys. And our series of 2,500 Major League Baseball pitchers across a 12-year period, none had ever been placed on the disabled list for dislocating their throwing shoulder anteriorly. So it would have seemed that instead of making you an increased risk of uh, getting an anterior instability, the better thrower you are, you're actually protected from anterior instability. So we touched a little bit of, about the mechanism of instability and let's talk now about uh, some more evidence to see why this might actually be the case. There's a whole raft of evidence in this case. I'll just talk about one paper because this is in vivo, it's imaging, but there's a, a great line of this kind of stuff. In this paper, they took some people who had slap tears, uh, compared them with people who had cuff tears, put them in an MR, both with their arm by their side and in abduction and external rotation, 
And in that position, they tracked where the head of the humerus was relative to the glenoid. And they could say, well, is the head of the humerus, as it shifts from down by the side to abduction and external rotation, is it going forwards or backwards and by how far? And so our controls, when the arm's by the side, it sits pretty much exactly centred, not anterior, not posterior, perhaps a fraction of a mil posterior. When they take their arm out into abduction and external rotation, their shoulder goes backwards by about a millimetre. Our guys with our kind of pathology, they too start with their arm down by their side and they experience a big difference in how far their shoulder translates. It goes a long way backwards. So when you get these slap injuries, rather than wanting to dislocate forwards, your shoulder is actually translating posteriorly. So if the slap lesion is a central lesion of these throwing athletes, this helps to explain to us why these guys don't dislocate their shoulder anteriorly. So how could it be that slaps are protecting your shoulder and preventing it from dislocating anteriorly? Well, if we go back to 1990 and Steve O'Brien's then award-winning paper, which reminded us of uh, the anterior and posterior inferior glenohumeral ligaments, all of us had know about this anterior one because we get taught it and drilled into us so much. But Steve reminded us of the size, structure, function and importance of the posterior band of this, which is in many respects just as large, just as important as the anterior band. But more importantly, he explained to us this notion that both the anterior and posterior bands sit underneath the humeral head, a lot like a hammock, so that when you rotate backwards and forwards, these bands move with the head of the humerus to keep this whole area stable and centralised, like these pinheads here. So if there is a difference in the posterior structures, I've represented it as the posterior capsule here, but the posterior cuff would equally make sense. It is only posterior when your arm's down by your side. And the essential lesion happens here when your arm's back into this position. And in that case, that post the structure that was posterior down by the side ends up anterior and inferior. If that structure is aberrantly tight, thick, short, what direction is that going to make the head of the humerus translate? It's going to pull it posterosuperiorly. So this is the mechanism of protecting your shoulder from anterior instability. Hey, wait a minute, that relocation sign, when you push the, the pain, well, 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 the head of the humerus is attached to the scapula, unfortunately. So when I push on that, I don't just push on the head of the humerus, I'm pushing on both of those things. So my argument is that if one of the sources of pain for these guys is the inside impingement of the cuff, which I'd suggest is, when I'm pushing that backwards and forwards, basically I'm just changing horizontal AB, AD duction. It's just I'm doing it here rather than here. And if you just reassess the same thing with your patients, you'll find their pain goes away just as much by horizontally AD ducting them by about 15 degrees. The slap part of things we need to understand a little bit more, and if this kind of thing bakes your cookie, go and read this paper from quite a while ago now, which is the, by far and away the best anatomic description of the labrum I've seen. These were their methods, which of course we're not going to go into, but I'll draw on two particular things. Uh, so this is looking at a glenoid, that's anterior, this is posterior, that's superior. One of the things to remind us is that the superior labrum, uh, sorry, the entire labrum I should say, is essentially an extension of the biceps tendon superiorly and the triceps tendon inferiorly. Uh, so this is collagenous here, this is fibrocartilaginous before it inserts as Sharpie's fibres. This bit around the edge that we call the labrum, the German guys call the periarticular fibre system. And it's essentially the fibrocartilaginous extension of these two tendons. The other thing that these guys underscored to us, so now we're looking in section. This is a, a right glenoid. We've taken a chop inside there, so this is subchondral bone. This is the articular cartilage, which is in the centre part here. And this is what we call the labrum going around the periphery. Here at the four o'clock position, uh, there's absolutely no gap between the articular cartilage and the periarticular fibre system, the labrum. Up here at the 10 o'clock position, we can see this gap in between the two, which doesn't extend all the way to the subchondral bone, of between 1 and 2 millimetres, depending on where you want to measure this. And in this cadaveric study, which was unusual for cadaveric studies, in that 10 of the 30 subjects within it were young, 26 years of age, they found that there is a gap from the 10 o'clock position around to the 12 o'clock position in practically everybody in that cohort. If we think back to Steve Snyder's original definition of what a slap lesion was, this is the definition of a type 1 slap lesion, 55 out of 140 in Steve's series. 
Or if you aren't that careful and you don't go in and have a look and you just say, I see a gap here and you don't actually see that this is pulled off the glenoid rim, so if you don't get your finger in underneath there or whatever it is surgeons do and pull it up and show that this has been wrenched off the glenoid, you could conceivably misdiagnose the normal anatomy here as a type 2 slap lesion. And that was 77 of his 140. So that perhaps helps explain to us why we, are, why we saw this data from an awful long time ago now showing that about four out of five professional baseball pitchers who said there's nothing wrong with them have labral abnormalities. And Lesniak's group a little bit more recently showed that the best correlate of cuff tears and labral injuries is simply innings pitched and that changes on MR don't tell us anything about subsequent pain in any of these guys. And that perhaps shouldn't be surprising when we look at the innovation of the glenoid labrum and from this entire paper, which to my knowledge is the only paper that's documented the innovation of the glenoid labrum, here's the complete text of the innovation of the labrum and it comes down to one sentence. There's only some nerves occasionally in the peripheral half of the labrum. So you can do an awful lot of damage to your glenoid labrum and never know about it. It's like getting a haircut or cutting your fingernails. Now to the mechanism of uh, getting a superior labral injury. While Joe Average might do it like this, picking up something heavy or falling off a ladder, the mechanism in throwers relates back to rotational range of motion. And because the long head of biceps is trapped in the bicipital groove, as you externally rotate, you can see uh, the biceps anchor here, this superior part of the labrum getting pulled back. Now imagine what happens if I was to superimpose some posterosuperior translation on this. Of course, we're going to have much more tension being placed on that biceps anchor, and this is the essential lesion of the throwing shoulder. So think about this in terms of rotation of the head of the humerus, trapping the biceps and adjacent anchor, and now it also probably makes sense to you why this proximal biceps tendon also gets smashed up, and this is uh, richly innovated and highly vascular. This is the one that will probably give you the most pain clinically. So what do you do about it? Somebody's in front of you now and it says it hurts when I throw. Well, we need to figure out, we're going to look at rotational range and strength, but you need to figure out, does it hurt before you let go of the ball? Ideally, we'd divide it up into these two phases, or after you've let go of the ball. And what we want to know from that is, if they tell you it hurts before they let go of the ball, and the key there is you'll find out that why they're really coming to you is because they can't throw as hard as they used to, they can't serve, they can't spike as hard as they used to. And then we need to check especially external rotation range of motion. Do relocation if you want, but it will be positive. And if they say that their pain is after they've let go of the ball, then they won't be in your office because they can throw just as hard as they always did. It just hurts now, but it doesn't impact on their performance, so they don't turn up to you. But there, if you're in the lucky enough situation that you can monitor this, check their follow-through range of motion and strength, and that's these structures. Hey, but what about the dead arm and throwing a dead arm? You mentioned that. That's got to be associated with dislocation, doesn't it? Get to the bottom of what they actually mean by a dead arm. If they do say dead arm, then you've got to at least do a sensory evaluation of these guys. I don't find reflexes to be much use with them. And in my experience, if they do have sensory disturbance, this is going to be coming from their thoracic outlet. This won't be a true um, throwing shoulder as we've been talking about. Their dead arm is, no, 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 I used to throw 90 miles an hour and now I'm just dead. I just, I just can't lift my arm. I just can't throw as hard as I used to. I can feel everything. Everything feels okay. But my arm's dead. It's not lively, okay? This is a jargon mistake we made. Rotational range of motion. We're aware that we should think about this total rotational range of motion, not just the individual internal and external rotation components. But to understand that better, we need to understand that throwing athletes in particular have variation in the amount of twist about the long axis of the humerus that shifts this. Uh, so lots of people have looked at this. The way we looked at it was with um, ultrasound. And to understand the effect of this, you need to just get into your mind that with the glenohumeral joint in exactly the same position, by varying this twist about the long axis of the humerus, so this guy would be relatively more retrotorted, so his total rotational range of motion is the same as his evil twin just here. But when his, uh, when his humerus is that shape, he seems to have more external and less internal rotation than the other guy. So this is how we interpret the rotational range of motion. But you have to measure torsion on both sides because it varies a lot. The first 200 people we looked at, 
It varied by between 74 degrees between any of those two individuals and any one individual might be as much as 45 degrees more externally or 12 degrees more internally rotated on their dominant arm. For our acceleration rate, guys, once you've set an appropriate external rotation range of motion target, a nice clinical uh, point you can take home is you can predict how hard these guys are going to throw. If they can only get their arm to there, that's just a release point. They can't cock, accelerate and throw. And as they restore this range of motion, they're going to be able to throw harder at perceived uh, different ranges. I find this to be a better measure of the posterior structure's flexibility uh, because we've taken up all the slack in the posterior capsule before you then measure the internal rotation range of motion. So anterior capsule's not so much of an interfering factor. Finally, with strength, uh, the way that we measure it is to tuck your elbow in by your side, get your handheld dyno, place it up against the ulnar styloid with 90-90 just there. Um, get them in a nice athletic stance, get them to push back in against you once until you feel they've taken up all their load and then just do a break force for internal and then do the same thing external. We do three of these and just keep the best score. And in looking that with non-throwers and throwers, we find that this cut point of the ratio between IR and ER of 1.5 seems to delineate the injured and the healthy athletes. So the way you would explain it to them is that while this is what Joe Average might look like, if he's stronger, weaker, bigger, smaller, then the strength of internal and external rotation should maintain this relation. So you just came to me with this much internal, so I reckon you should have that much external rotation strength. So we're going to track how this strength goes as you get better and make sure that's tracking back with how you feel and how much things are improving for you. Finally, shoulder flexibility. Again, just to hammer home the point, just knowing the flexibility difference doesn't tell you anything about whether they've truly lost internal or external rotation range of motion. Don't even bother reporting this because it's meaningless. There's no relation here until you've accounted for torsion. When you want to report back strength, we found it more useful to report it back in terms of uh, percentage of body weight. So this is actually for our national handball team just before they uh, won a silver medal at the Worlds. And then external, we can do the same thing and then, of course, derive those ratios and flag the guys that we want to go and intervene on. Thanks very much for your time.